All right. Well, I will start. Uh, we'll, we'll certainly have time for people to keep joining us, but I just want to say hello and thanks for joining us for today's webinar from the Institute for Research on Poverty at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I'm Judith Sears Poisson and I'm pleased to be your host today. Our webinar today is on improving how poverty is measured, a recommendation to better reflect households' basic needs. A new report from the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine offers recommendations for updating how poverty is measured in the United States, with a special focus on the costs of childcare and healthcare, as well as regional differences in housing costs. And we are so fortunate to have five members of the committee that produced the report with us today to discuss their work. We have an hour and a half today, and we, after we hear from each of our presenters, we'll spend the last 30 minutes or so at the end for a live Q&A. And if you have questions, you can type those in through the Q&A box. We did get quite a few questions submitted as people registered, so we'll be queuing some of those up as well. I hope you'll also feel free to participate through chat. We'd love to know who you are and where you're joining us from. I also want to let you know that we have closed captions enabled, so you can toggle those on and off at the bottom of your screen. And if you're having any technical issues during the webinar, please let us know in the chat and we'll do our best to help. We will be posting the slides and the recording of the webinar within a day or so, and because you registered, you'll be receiving a link to those by email. I also want to acknowledge the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation at the Department of Health and Human Services for their partial support of this webinar series through their funding of IRP as the National Research Center on Poverty and Economic Mobility. All right, with those housekeeping items out of the way, I want to turn it over to the first of our panelists who will introduce his colleagues and get us started. Dr. Indy Dedagupta is the President and Executive Director of the Center for Law and Social Policy, or CLASP. An IRP affiliate, he was formerly the co-executive director of the Georgetown Center on Poverty and Inequality. Indy? Thank you, Judith. I have the pleasure of introducing uh, some of my uh, co-contributors to the National Academy's uh, study and um, the folks who are presenting on this panel, and then I'll disappear for uh, a bit and uh, rejoin folks for the questions and answers at the end, uh, where we encourage folks to use the Q&A function in Zoom. So uh, I'll introduce all four of the panelists and then turn it over to our first presenter. So first is Dr. James Ziliak, who is Professor um, and Carol Martin Gatton Endowed Chair in Microeconomics and the founding director of the Center for Poverty Research at the University of Kentucky. He's also the founding executive director of the Kentucky Federal Statistical Research Data Center and an IRP affiliate. Then we'll have Dr. Barbara Wolf, who is the Richard A. Easterlin Professor Emerita of Economics, Public Affairs, and Population Health Sciences at UW Madison. She's also an IRP affiliate and a former IRP director. And then we'll have Dr. Jane Walpogel, who is the Compton founding. Foundation Centennial Professor of Social Work for the Prevention of Children and Youth Problems at Columbia University and is co-director of the Columbia Population Research Center. She is also an IRP affiliate. Then we'll have Dr. Ingrid Gould Ellen, who is the Paulette Goddard Professor of Urban Policy and Planning and Director for, Furman, for the Furman Center for Real Estate and Urban Policy in New York University's Robert F. Wagner Graduate School of Public Service. So with that, let me turn things over to Jim. Thank you so much, Indy. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, in addition to my uh, esteemed colleagues who are joining uh, me today here on this webinar, I wanna recognize the many other people who contributed to this report. First, the other panelists included uh, Randy Aki of UCLA, Sarah Bone of PPIC, uh, Bradley Hardy of Georgetown University, David Johnson, who's now at CNSTAT, Sanders Corman at uh, CUNY, Helen Levy at University of Michigan, Jordan Matsudera at Columbia, who's currently on service to, to the Biden administration and the Department of Education, Jose Pacas at Kids First Chicago, Shelly Verplog at the Economic Research Service, and uh, most especially, I also want to recognize the study director, Chris Mackey, as well as uh, the senior scholar on the project, uh, Connie Citro, uh, 
who, uh, as many of you know, was the uh, program, uh, the study director on the 1995 poverty report. And uh, in addition, Anthony Mann, who is the program associate, who is instrumental in organizing our many meetings over the last uh, two years. Next slide, please. So I wanna begin with uh, uh, some expert, uh, excerpts uh, from the statement of tasks of what our panel was, was tasked to do. Uh, this study was commissioned by the uh, US Census Bureau and the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Uh, we were asked to ensure that the current supplemental poverty measure is fulfilling its mandate to provide information on aggregate levels of economic need that informs the public understanding of what economic conditions and trends affecting people from low, with lower incomes. In addition, we were asked to consider modifications that would increase the value of the SPM to policymakers and researchers for the uses to which it is or potentially could be applied. Uh, as part of that, we are asked to review methods that are currently used to construct uh, the poverty thresholds, to look at uh, the survey data uh, used in construction of the measure, uh, as well as uh, assessing the potential role of alternative data sources for poverty measurement. Now, the focus of our report is on changes to the SPM after the 2021 cycle. Um, uh, next slide, please. So the report begins with the overall summary. Uh, there's an introduction. Uh, we have a long chapter, chapter two, on the conceptual basis of the supplemental measure. And then the remainder of the report focuses on those uh, difficult issues that uh, confront uh, the current measure of the SPM, namely the treatment of medical care, uh, the treatment of child care, the treatment of housing and shelter, and then lastly, some of the data infrastructure issues. All of these topics were addressed in the 1995 National Academy panel. Uh, some of these aspects are certainly incorporated in one uh, way or another in the current SPM. So our panel focused on whether or not those uh, difficult areas are currently meeting the needs uh, for poverty measurement purposes and the recommendations that follow in our report, which we'll highlight uh, in our webinar today, uh, focus on those, uh, those very uh, difficult authority issues, uh, which we hope to elucidate more uh, in the next uh, hour and a half. Next, please. Before I proceed, I think it's important to pause for a moment to uh, recognize, uh, first of all, uh, a very dear friend to uh, those of us uh, on the panel uh, and to many, many uh, across uh, the government and academia. And that is, we dedicated this uh, report to the memory of Rebecca Blank, who is uh, most uh, uh, immediately the, uh, the chancellor of the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, and previously, she has served as Dean of the Michigan Ford School, as Under Secretary of Commerce, and in uh, a variety of other uh, positions uh, in academia and in government service. Uh, Becky was an absolute champion of, of uh, understanding and combating poverty, as well as a champion of measuring poverty, and an important champion of getting the supplemental poverty measure off the ground and moving uh, during her time at the Census Bureau. Uh, sadly, Becky uh, passed away this past February, and we therefore want to recognize the great contribution she uh, made to poverty research and to each of us uh, individually. The co-coordinator on the report was Robert Moffitt. Uh, Robert stepped up, uh, and we want to thank Robert, especially for for handling all the uh, important uh, comments we received. The report has seven external reviewers uh, that we received detailed comments on the preliminary draft, uh, many if not most of which are incorporated in the final version. Next slide, please. So let me begin briefly with a brief uh, reminder of uh, where we're at and where this panel proposes we go. The OPM, or otherwise known as the official poverty measure, has been the standard bearer 
uh, measure of poverty in the United States since the 1960s. Uh, basically, the idea is we want to identify some basic needs that households uh, need to meet, the resources required to meet those needs, and whether or not uh, they uh, fall short. And therefore, the poverty rate then is the fraction of the population whose uh, resources fall below that basic need bundle. That need bundle under the OPM was based on uh, a 1955 uh, food survey. Um, and because at the, in the mid 1950s, the typical American family spent one third of their uh, budget on food, then the official poverty measure threshold is defined as three times what is defined to be the minimally uh, required food budget for a family based on family size. There is no geographic adjustment for the poverty threshold, okay? So it varies by, by uh, family size. The resources um, are then uh, pre-tax. So it includes all forms of, uh, most forms, I should say, of cash income. It does not include capital gains and losses, but uh, which are uncommon amongst low-income families anyhow. But it, it does capture most major forms of cash income. The unit of analysis is, is the family, which are individuals related by uh, marriage, birth, and adoption. Um, in the 1995 National Academy report, uh, they uh, strongly uh, recommended a move away from the official poverty measure towards a new measure. And the supplemental me uh, poverty measure is an outgrowth of that 95 National Academy report. The, the basic need bundle from the S with the SPM is examination of what's needed to cover food, clothing, shelter, utilities, phone, internet, and what's known as a little extra. The little extra is a 20% multiplier on the sum of expenditure on food, clothing, shelter, utilities, phone, and internet. And uh, this is set at uh, a fraction of the median expenditure in the population. It varies by uh, household size in the SPM unit. It varies by whether you're a homeowner with a mortgage or without a mortgage and by renters. And there are geographic adjustments for over 300 geographic units uh, based on metropolitan and non-metropolitan status. So a pretty dramatic change in the measure of the, uh, of the basic need bundle. The OPM that, or excuse me, the resources then are the uh, OPM income, uh, along with, so what's new is in-kind benefits. This would include food stamps, otherwise known as SNAP, uh, earning uh, uh, WIC uh, benefit payments. We also include tax credits like the EITC and the child tax credit. The subtract away out-of-pocket spending on medical costs, uh, out-of-pocket spending on child support, out-of-pocket spending on work expenses, which includes child care, as well as deducting uh, tax payments at the federal state uh, uh, level, as well as payroll taxes. The, the family unit uh, for the SPM measure is broader than the OPM. It includes cohabiting partners. It includes unrelated uh, children under age 15. Uh, and so uh, it has a broader concept of, of who shares resources. Okay. Next, please. Now, the key recommendation to begin our report is that uh, due to its vital role in tracking the effects of public policies and programs and the size and composition of the uh, population living in or near poverty, uh, the, the panel has recommended that the supplemental poverty measure should be elevated to the nation's headline poverty statistic and renamed accordingly. And we're, uh, the panel recommends the name of uh, the principal poverty measure or the PPM. Okay, so again, this is gonna be for uh, statistical purposes only. So recommendation 2.4 then says that the principal poverty measure uh, should expand the set of threshold uh, categories beyond the current uh, set of food, clothing, shelter, utilities, and uh, telephone and internet uh, to include those uh, policies that uh, have evolved since the establishment of the SPM, okay? So next slide, please. 
So what the PPM is going to do in the bottom row of this slide here is uh, health insurance will, will be added as a basic need to the bundle. Child care will be added as a basic need. And we propose a modification on the treatment of housing. And each of the panelists who follow me are gonna cover each of these topics sequentially. We also then, because we need to balance what changes happen on the basic need bundle for the threshold, we need to balance it off with changes to the measure of resources. And therefore the panel recommends uh, modifications on the resource side treatment of health insurance, childcare and housing to balance these off. Uh, the last recommendation is that uh, we should broaden the measure of who's counted in the unit to all members of the household. Okay, so this is a broader measure than the current SPM uh, family unit. And if time permits in the Q&A section, we can cover that. So uh, without further delay, I would like to turn it over to Barbara Wolf to tell you about the proposed changes to uh, medical care side of the measure. Barbara? Thank you, Jim. As Jim just noted, medical care is not included in the official poverty measure and only included in the supplementary poverty measure in the form of a deduction from resources. The deduction known as MOOP or medical out-of-pocket is made up of insurance premiums, co-pays, deductibles, and other payments. This means that medical care is not included as a basic need in either of the current poverty measures. This is an important omission as medical care has grown tremendously since the official poverty measure was begun. And as of 2021, made up 18.3% of gross domestic product or nearly $13,000 per capita. It was only about 5.6% or a much smaller part of a much smaller gross domestic product when uh, the OP, when the OPM was first utilized. Most medical care is paid for by insurance. About 92% of uh, the US population was insured last year and covers 70% of expenditures on medical care. The US government is a major payer for medical care. Uh, it accounts for about 15% of the federal outlays and dwarfs the next uh, form of in-kind transfer programs to the poor. It seems clear then that medical care should be included in our measure of poverty and that by including it, we will have more accurate counts and better measure the role of the public sector in decreasing uh, poverty. The SPM or supplementary poverty measure does include medical care, but is noted only as a deduction from resources. This creates a number of difficulties just to highlight a few, does not capture unmet medical needs of people who are underinsured or uninsured, and this will include many of those who are poor. It does not cap medical out-of-pocket expenditures, so it implicitly assumes that a family's medical care need is exactly identical to the amount they spend on out-of-pocket care, which would mean that there would be including unnecessary care as well as not capturing insufficient care. Lastly, it does not capture the role of the government in providing coverage of medical care, but only captures it somewhat indirectly by reducing MOOP. So our first recommendation, the one you see up on your screen, is to replace the current approach to medical spending in the supplementary poverty measure to one that includes health insurance in both the needs threshold and resources. In other words, we recommend moving to a health inclusive poverty measure. And before going on, I just want to note that much of the work on this was carried out by Sanders Corman and Dahlia Remler. Their approach, we had, which we have adapted for our recommendations, has been actively studied by people at Census, and uh, that allows us to, to have confidence that it would be possible to do this without a great deal of difficulty. This would mean that medical care would be included both as a need 
and uh, incorporated in resources. On the threshold side, the basic need for health insurance can be represented by a premium to buy health insurance. You can think of this as reflecting both the risk of needing medical care and the expected cost of that care. Once we have laws that require guaranteed issue, which simply means that everyone can buy a policy regardless of whether or not they have pre-existing conditions, and community, and community rating of health insurance premiums, we would be able to utilize a health insurance premium as a measure of the basic need for medical care. These conditions were accomplished through the Affordable Care Act, but that still leaves the question of what premium should be included. The Affordable Care Act establishes a health insurance marketplace along with defining an essential benefits package that meets the requirements. It captures what we can think of as society as defining the basic need for coverage. So we believe then that we can in incorporate health insurance in the estimates through something that has been established through uh, the ACA. So specifically, what we're proposing is that the uh, principal poverty measure would add the price of the benchmark health insurance plan, the unsubsidized premium, to the poverty threshold to represent health insurance need. This is defined as the second least expensive premium for silver plan, which actuarially covers 70% of expected health care. On the resource side, the PPM would add a value for the health insurance benefits provided by the government or employers to household resources. And I'll come back to this shortly. So recommendation uh, 3.2 is that for individuals under 65, excluding those who have Medicare uh, due to disability, we would use the Affordable Care Act benchmark health insurance plan to represent the basic health insurance need for a typical American household. This, for the older population, the population age 65 and over who are covered by Medicare, we would instead use the full cost of a Medicare Advantage plan in that uh, healthcare market that provides prescription drug coverage. Next slide, please. On the resource side, we recommend that we uh, take into account the um, benefits received either from the government or through an employer. So we would add the value from, let's say, uh, either a Medicaid or from uh, Medicare or from the employer uh, to resources, but we would cap that at the value uh, that has been added to needs on the basis of the ACA benchmark plan. So that takes into account the fact that health insurance will not put a roof over your head. It is not uh, fungible to use the uh, more technical term. Lastly, we recommend that medical out-of-pocket spending should be subtracted from resources in the principal poverty measure. This would be done, uh, again, capping it uh, for all those except those on Medicare by the uh, cap that is part of the ACA. This is a value of about $9,000 for an individual. Medicare currently does not have a cap, but starting in uh, 2025, it will have a cap. So again, we believe that medical out-of-pocket spending would be subtracted, but capped at uh, what is allowed in the uh, Medicare or uh, the ACA. What does that mean for those with employer-sponsored uh, health insurance? Well, the need is the same as that for others below 65. We would be using the benchmark plan in a healthcare market. 
then the value that one gets from their employer would be set at that same benchmark plan value. But if individuals were paying part of the premium, that would be subtracted from the value to uh, capture um, their actual situation in terms of how much they were paying or contributing to their health care, um, to their health care insurance. Now, why is this an improvement? Well, just very briefly, let's just take an example today of thinking about an uninsured individual who forgoes medical care entirely. Let's say this individual now get, receives subsidized coverage through an uh, Affordable Care Act marketplace plan. That allows them to obtain treatment, which they were not receiving. Um, but under the current supplementary poverty measure, their spending on premiums and co-pays would be deducted from their resources. So under the current situation, someone who was benefiting from subsidized ACA ben benchmark plan would actually um, maybe move below the poverty line because their expenditures on the premium and any co-pays would be subtracted from resources, but there would be no noting of the contribution of the federal government to subsidizing the uh, actual policy, the ACA policy. So let me just conclude by saying medical care is a major component of individual spending today, whether it's done directly or in the form of health insurance. It's a major and growing component of the U.S. gross domestic product. Medicaid and Medicare are by far the government's largest in-kind transfer programs, and health insurance is the largest non-wage benefit provided by employers. To accurately measure poverty, it really is necessary to include the need for medical care and the value of these transfers in the measurement. And with that, I will turn it over to Jane. Um, thank you, Bobby, um, and nice to be here. Thank you, Jim, for setting us up and inviting us, and thank you, IRP, for organizing this webinar. Um, so I'm going to talk about the uh, child care recommendations, uh, somewhat different from the medical care arena. As Bobby was uh, highlighting, there's been a lot of research leading up to this report on a health-inclusive poverty measure, and so the panel was able to draw on that research in developing the recommendations. In contrast, there really had not been and has not been that kind of research on what would look, what would be uh, essentially a child care inclusive poverty measure. And so we were really starting uh, from a more fundamental point. And so maybe not surprisingly, the approach that our recommendations are much more incremental and really move through some of the, the issues with the child care measurement as it exists currently in the supplemental poverty measure and then try to lead to future research that will uh, more fully address the issues. So our first recommendation really addresses uh, a very technical point in the current supplemental poverty measure. Currently in the supplemental poverty measure, as Jim noted at the outset, uh, if a family has work expenses related to childcare, those are deducted from income in the same way that medical out-of-pocket expenses are deducted from income. This is only done currently in the supplemental poverty measure if a parent is working and if there's no other parent uh, in the home available to care for the child. Um, so um, there's a couple of issues with that and our first recommendation uh, tries to address those. So our first recommendation is parents who are in education or training should be treated like parents who are employed. So if they have childcare expenses, those too should be deducted from their income because those are essential in order to permit them to be in education or training, just as they are essential for parents to be working. And then secondly, if there's a parent in the home who's not working but is disabled, that parent shouldn't be assumed to be available to provide childcare while the other parent is working or in education or training. So that, that first recommendation is really a technical fix to what's currently done in the supplemental poverty measure. Um, the second recommendation is more in the spirit of the whole approach of this report. As Jim emphasized, the whole approach of this report 
is to establish a need in the threshold and then define a set of resources to meet that need and to expand the threshold beyond the food, shelter, clothing, utilities, and a little bit more. So um, consistent with that, the second recommendation is that a basic childcare need should be included in the threshold. And this would be in specifically for, fam for households that are using paid childcare. Let's put aside for the moment families who aren't using paid childcare, and there are quite a few of them, but let's just stick with the families who are using paid childcare. Um, so let's treat them consistently with how we're treating other types of expenditures, including medical care, and let's put a basic childcare need in the threshold. And uh, to do that, the Census Bureau would need to conduct research to develop and implement a methodology for defining the amount of that basic childcare need. And obviously that would vary by the age of the child or children, the number of children, their geographic location, since childcare costs vary tremendously around the country. And of course the hours that the person is working or in school or in training and using childcare. Uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, in parallel with that, if we're gonna have uh, a measure of childcare need in the threshold, we would want to have also a measure of child care resources. So again, focusing only on households that are using paid child care for the moment, the Census Bureau would need to research, develop, and implement a methodology for valuing assistance received by the household for child care. So that can enter into the calculation of the household's available resources. So that assistance might be through child care subsidies, child care tax credits, through employer child care assistance, although that's pretty rare, um, through uh, assistance provided by local charitable organizations, churches, you know, whatever. Um, so uh, consistent with the approach of having needs in the threshold, resources on the other side, we'd wanna have a measure of the resources available to the family or household to meet the child care need. So that's for families that currently use paid child care. As I mentioned, there are a lot of families who don't use paid childcare or use a mix of paid and unpaid. Um, it's not like the, the medical care or the healthcare situation where, you know, as Bobby noted, the vast majority of families have health insurance and virtually everyone will use some paid healthcare at some point. Uh, there's a limit to what you can treat on your own. It's very different with childcare. Many families use paid unpaid childcare uh, they provide the care themselves, or they use family, friends, relatives, neighbors, uh, what have you. Uh, so how to address that in, in the supplemental poverty measure and in the principal poverty measure um, is something that we, we decided uh, really requires future research and discussion to, to address the whole topic of unpaid child care, whether such share, care should be reflected in poverty measurement, and if so, how that should be reflected. Um, I can, in the Q&A, I can talk about some of our thoughts about how that might be done, but um, given the lack of research to date on this in contrast to the healthcare arena, um, we felt like we really would, I can say I personally felt like we would have been going way out on a limb to develop a methodology and an approach in the absence of the, of the kind of research that had been done for the health inclusive poverty measure. So this is very much an area for future discussion and future research. But we think that the first three recommendations that we've made uh, will already move us forward in improving the measurement of childcare costs and childcare need and childcare assistance, and will open the door for a more thorough examination of the whole childcare topic, which is just obviously incredibly important for families with children. And with that, I'll hand off to Ingrid, who's going to talk about the housing chapter. Great. Um, so I'm I'm delighted to be here. Um, thank you to to Jim again, and and thank you to to IRP for hosting this webinar. Um, I'm going to talk uh, about our treatment of housing in, in the report, um, treatment of housing or shelter. Um, housing is the, the largest component of household spending, um, especially for low-income households. Just to give one example, in 2021, renter households in, in the lowest income quintile in the United States typically spend 63% of their income on housing. So that's nearly two-thirds 
of their already, already low incomes. And, and so the choice of how to handle the cost of housing and a poverty measure um, is really critical and can have a major impact on, on who is counted as, as poor. Um, and um, to be clear, right, unlike the case of, of um, medical care and child care, shelters already included in the threshold measure for the current um, SPM, um, but uh, the current supplemental poverty measure, but our aim was to treat housing and utility costs in a more simple, transparent, and consistent way. And I think the, 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 the approach that we recommend really mirrors the approach that, that um, the report recommends on on um, on healthcare and 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 uh, I should just say briefly that the current SBM does little to adjust for for housing quality. Um, it ignores what are often um, large differentials in, in rent levels across rural counties within a state, and and it uses distinct thresholds for for renters, for um, homeowners with mortgages, and for homeowners without mortgages. Even though all three groups face the same basic need for for shelter and um, and uh, we th we think that we can that it, it makes sense to have a consistent threshold and 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 so um, our first recommendation is that the principal poverty measure housing thresholds um, should be based on shelter shelter costs for renters only um, and and to be clear right housing thresholds right they're they're aimed to capture the cost of securing adequate shelter and. And so um, we recommend that there's three thresholds be set based on um, shelter costs for renters in the local metropolitan area or the rural county since, since most low income households rent. Um, and more fundamentally, all households, regardless of whether they own or rent, face the same basic need for shelter. And, I, and I'll say more about this in a, in a minute. But um, further, we recommend that the principal poverty measure set rent thresholds based on the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development's fair market rents, which they estimate annually to, to capture the threshold costs of a moderately priced standard quality private market dwelling in, in the local housing market. And um, fair market rents um, operationally are, are, are generally set at the 40th percentile of, of gross rents, and gross rents includes both rent costs and utility costs for standard quality um, homes for recent movers, right? And, then, and the focus is on recent movers because that better captures housing costs for those who are actively seeking housing. Um, often people who have lived in a home a long time, renters get sort of a discount for that sort of long tenure. Um, um, fair market rents vary across local markets, um, and they also vary with the number of bedrooms in a home. And they're estimated annually, right? HUD um, estimates them, HUD, the US Department of, of Housing and Urban Development, or HUD, estimates them annually, mostly in order to set subsidy levels for what is the largest um, rental assistance program in in the United States, the Housing Choice Voucher Program, and and um, the uh, Housing Choice Voucher Program basically pays part of the rent for low income households um, who are renting homes on the on the private market, and and HUD pegs voucher subsidy um, levels to fair market rents to make sure that the the government is giving low income households a housing subsidy that is appropriately sized given their, given their um, household size and, and also the rents in the local market. Um, so the advantages of using the fair market rent are, you know, include it's, it's simple, right? It's transparent um, and it's very feasible because again, HUD already um, um, estimates uh, geographically specific fair market rents and household size specific fair market rents on, on an, an annual basis. And, and plus the fair market rent based approach is consistent, very consistent with our proposed approach, approach for medical care um, as it uses a pre-existing standard of basic need and cost that's already used for uh, used by the federal government for for um, other purposes, programmatic purposes. Um, so um, 
are, are related, a second key related recommendation is that the principal poverty measure should use a single threshold for all households, right? I mentioned this, that the current adjustment of, of shelter thresholds in the in the supplemental poverty measure is, is complicated and, and not very transparent. Um, it, um, it uh, and it, again, it treats, it has different thresholds as if, you know, needs are different for renters, for homeowners with mortgages, for homeowners without mortgages. Um, and, and, um, and plus conceptually, you know, we think that the principal property um, measure threshold should capture what it costs to live in a decent quality home in a given metropolitan area or a rural county, regardless of the choice a particular households makes about how to pay for that shelter. And, and the PPM should control. So we, so we believe that the PPM or the principal poverty measure should control for cost of living differences across areas, but not households consumption or, or financing choices. So um, if you can go to the next slide now. Um, that said, you know, we do believe that the principal poverty measure should account for the fact that homeowners do have an asset that effectively delivers income to them, right? And that implicit rental income should be treated as a resource. So in other words, homeowners receive a benefit from renting homes to themselves or, or maybe more intuitively from not having to pay monthly rent, which frees up resources for, for other needs. And, um, and so we believe that the principal poverty measure should take into account the rental value of a homeowner's home. Right? And, and now accurately capturing that rental value isn't easy um, because it's it's not observed, right, by definition. Um, but but many government agencies um, around the world, um, including in the Netherlands and Iceland and Switzerland, estimate such implicit rent. And actually the US Bureau of Economic Analysis um, estimates implicit rent and valuing shelter services um, for the calculation of the gross domestic product in the United States. So this is not without precedent. Um, and we talk in the report about different ways of, of capturing this, but, it, but in the short run, sort of the easiest thing the Census Bureau could do would be to simply use the fair market rent um, in calculating um, uh, in, um, for, for the local market and, and, um, and household size to calculate the implicit rent that homeowners are, are basically paying to themselves or sort of earning. Um, this would be consistent with um, the use of fair market rents and calculating the, the, the threshold cost of renting an acceptable quality home. Um, and it also has the advantage of, of automatically capping implicit rent at the fair market rent level. And so, you know, while it's possible you know, probably somewhat unusual for, for homeowners, for low-income homeowners to live in larger and more expensive homes. Even if they do, it's not easy to convert sort of the higher value of those homes into disposable income and consumption of, of other goods, right, as, as, as Bobby talked about. Um, so we only credit homeowners, we argue that you should, um, census should only credit homeowners with, with resources up to the amount, sort of implicit income resources, up to the amount it takes to rent a standard quality home of an appropriate size in their local market. Um, so they're not, they don't get sort of extra um, money, implicit income that they really couldn't really convert into, into consumption. Um, and finally, the last recommendation that I want to highlight is that, um, that we do recognize that homeowners um, face ongoing costs, right? If anyone on the call owns their home, right? You know that um, there are some ongoing costs that you have to pay that, um, uh, in order to maintain that home. And so we recommend that those homeowner user costs be subtracted from this calculation of implicit rental income. And, and those user costs could, would include um, interest income, um, mortgage interest in, um, payments, property taxes, and, and other maintenance expenses that are typically incurred by homeowners. Um, once again, we recommend, and again, this is consistent with the, the our medical care recommendations that um, we recommend capping those user costs at the value of the rental um, implicit rental income so that net implicit rental income cannot be negative. Okay, that sounds a little that's a little wonky, but basically, 
you know, it, it means that sort of where there may be homeowners who face really high user costs, they could be credited with basically no implicit rental income at all and be treated just like renters. Um, but we assume that homeowners are no worse off start off as sort of no worse off than than renters in their in their same in, in the same markets that have to pay rent. Um, um, and I'm happy to talk um, a little more sort of, you know, about some of the technical issues in the um, in the Q&A. But I, I do want to just end by saying that, you know, just reiterating that that, um, you know, housing is a is a huge part of of and a growing part. Right. We are paying more collectively more of our incomes on rent, um, significantly more than we did even two decades ago, much more than we did, um, you know, sort of 50 years ago. And so, so treating um, housing in a, in a, in a, in a poverty measure is, is really critical. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it back to, to Jim. Thank you, Ingrid. So uh, one note before I proceed, we received a, a question in the, in the chat, you know, about uh, recommendations uh, because they're out of order. We, for the purposes of our presentation, we've just highlighted selected recommendations. The report has many others that that uh, are available and uh, my browser is not cooperating so, so great at this point in time, but we're gonna work on getting a link to the full report. So you can make sure you have uh, access to all the uh, uh, details of our report and, uh, and the uh, recommendations accordingly. So I'm gonna uh, wrap up before the Q&A with a, a couple of issues, one on data and statistical matters. And uh, in addition, uh, I'll talk about some uh, vexing issues that the panel discusses briefly, but did not feel as though there is sufficient evidence base to move forward at this time of recommendations. So first of all, uh, let me speak a little bit about uh, some of the data challenges. So currently the uh, official poverty measure and the uh, supplemental poverty measure are primarily based out of the current population survey, annual social and economic supplement. This is a, uh, the CPS uh, is a monthly survey conducted by the Bureau of Labor Statistics to produce the unemployment rate, the headline unemployment rate. In March of each year, the Census Bureau pays for a supplement to collect information on uh, income and program participation of households in the prior calendar year. The uh, March supplement, the ASEC, has roughly about 90,000 households in the sample frame and around 70,000 or so are, are interviewed uh, in any, uh, any given year. So uh, that's the main use. It provides our headline poverty rate uh, from the, the CPS. Um, and you can construct state level estimates as well from the CPS. It is nationally representative. The Census Bureau does recommend that you generally take a two or three year moving average when looking at state specific uh, uh, estimates. Um, that said, the CPS is really not designed uh, for sub-state analyses, but there is another major survey conducted by the Census Bureau called the American Community Survey. The ACS is uh, roughly about 3 million households that's uh, surveyed uh, throughout the year. Um, it does collect currently many of the income categories that the ASEC collects, but not all. Okay, so it doesn't have as complete a portion, uh, a, a complete a portrait of income uh, as the uh, in, at itemized level as the CPS does. Nonetheless, it's an excellent resource, and one of the key advantages of the ACS is that because of its size you can drill down to smaller geographies for uh, uh, analyzing trends in poverty. And I know today's webinar, many participants are from uh, state and local agencies, governments, uh, NGOs, who oftentimes work at the local level and, and look to the ACS for estimates of, of poverty. Uh, at this point in time, uh, the Census Bureau has been working aggressively at expanding uh, the development of the SPM using the American Community Survey. Uh, 
Of course, the OPM is currently available in the ACS. And so recommendation 6-1 uh, by the committee is to uh, leverage that American Community Survey as a springboard to the development of an ACS-based principal poverty measure that would be released annually along with the one-year ACS data, which currently is in the September of each year. We think that this would provide great value added for uh, policy and research purposes to have a, uh, a comprehensive measure of uh, statistical poverty available in the ACS, which we know many of you on this webinar would benefit uh, greatly from. The second recommendation I wanna highlight uh, is the panel uh, had uh, long discussions as well as uh, presentations on the current state of uh, the data infrastructure that's utilized uh, by the Census Bureau in the construction of poverty. The poverty measure is primarily a survey-based measure, meaning that we use self-reports of people's income in determining uh, the resources that they have. One of the challenges facing not only Census Bureau surveys, but all social surveys, not just in the US, but, but worldwide, is the increased uh, non-response. So there's an increase both in the fraction of people that refuse to participate in any portion of a survey, and there's also increased non-response in recent decades, in particular on questions dealing with earnings and income. Another challenge is that uh, when people do choose to respond to surveys, um, they uh, sometimes do not respond with 100% accuracy. This could be because they don't know certain sources of income because generally we use a, 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 an individual respondent on behalf of the household. So they may not uh, realize fully um, the income that's uh, received by all members of, of the household. Um, or there might be some uh, 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 failure to recall because if you, the, the way the survey is conducted, it's in the, roughly the March of the given year, and they ask about the prior calendar year's income. And so uh, there could have been individuals who move in and out of the household that had certain transfer income. And so one of the challenges facing uh, poverty measurement is uh, the underreporting in particular of transfer income, TANF, SNAP, uh, and associated benefits. So uh, our recommendation, and the Bureau is already doing this, is to expand the use of administrative data, both income and program benefits, to improve the estimates of resources in the principal poverty measure. In particular, the Bureau should aggressively explore the strategy of using these federal and state admin records to improve models for imputation, the item non-response, including non-reporting of receipt, as well as uh, amounts. In general, uh, uh, individuals uh, report earnings uh, quite accurately in the surveys. The challenge is getting people to report earnings in the surveys. And so uh, we do, the Census Bureau does have access to administrative data from the Social Security Administration where they receive uh, earnings for everybody covered by the Social Security program, which is over 90% of the labor force. Uh, more challenging administratively is getting access to the transfer data. Many transfers, while the benefits are uh, perhaps uh, paid for federally, uh, ownership of administration and ownership uh, of the data resides at the state level. And so therefore it requires uh, uh, memorandums of understanding between the uh, federal government and each state uh, to access these individual programs. The Bureau currently has agreements uh, for uh, almost half the states uh, to provide some, uh, some of their transfer income and is aggressively uh, working to incorporate that in uh, experimental measures. The, the panel really applauds the Bureau for those efforts and is encouraging them to, to move forward uh, to the extent practical. Next slide, please. Now, 
uh, this panel uh, covered a lot of terrain, but, but we didn't cover everything. And importantly, we want to uh, recognize that the uh, principal poverty measure is going to be a measure that will change and evolve over time as the economic situation and policies facing Americans changes over time. And therefore, uh, uh, the PPM would re uh, require regular review to ensure that it's adequately meeting its intended goal of measuring the economic fortunes of households in the United States. Along these lines, um, areas that the panel did discuss, um, but, but did not make any formal recommendations on at this point in time, include food. I have a bullet point there about treatment of childcare and not working households. Jane uh, adequately covered that and she'll discuss perhaps more in the Q&A, so I won't touch on that. I do wanna mention food right now. So right now food is measured using the consumer expenditure survey as part of a basic need. Um, it was generally agreed upon by the panel that the consumer expenditure survey is, is doing a, a good job at capturing uh, food spending of households. And so there was not a particular challenge facing the measurement of food. That said, our current plan, right, the, the uh, official poverty line is based on that food budget times three. The supplemental is the group of food, clothing, shelter, utilities, uh, and internet service, and a little bit extra. Um, and what we're moving, and it's uh, somewhat of a, of a well, it's an expenditure-based threshold, although there is some expert judgment associated with the construction, of course, of that expenditure-based uh, threshold. We are moving in the PPM with recommendations towards a more hybrid model where that threshold is not strictly expenditure-based, self-reported expenditures from the Consumer Expenditures Survey, but is a hybrid of both those expenditures as well as policy, uh, uh, public policy-based uh, uh, decisions which would include like the, the generosity of the ACA silver plan or the fair market rent in a geographic area. Um, there is a, uh, uh, a current uh, policy-based measure of food adequacy in the United States, and that's called the Thrifty Food Plan. And that underpins the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, SNAP, or otherwise known as food stamps. Um, the panel discussed this, and we talk about it in our report. One of the big challenges with the uh, uh, Thirsty Food Plan is that that strictly covers food spending, uh, food need at home, right? And uh, but a large fraction of spending in, amongst American households is a food away from home, right? Think about going to work and you have to go get some lunch uh, during the day. That would not be part of the TFP. Okay, but it's clearly part of, of uh, food need, okay? And so um, we encourage uh, future research and discussion on uh, coverage of food. Another category is uh, treatment of transportation as a basic need. Currently, transportation uh, shows up uh, as a subtraction um, for work-related transportation costs in the resource side. Um, and it is non-work related transportation factors in that 20% little bit extra in the resource in, in the threshold side of the equation. Um, transportation turns out to be uh, uh, for, men, for the typical household in America, the second largest expenditure after housing. And so uh, uh, the panel did feel as though there is a need for additional research on whether or not transportation should be incorporated uh, as a basic need in the threshold with the corresponding adjustment in the resource side, but we didn't feel as though there was sufficient evidence base to, to make a recommendation today. And then lastly, before I turn it over to Indy, is whether and how to account for assets and debt. Uh, this would say be, be including uh, 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 certain types of debts like education loan debts and things like that. The panel did discuss, we had experts come present to us on the treatment of assets and debts. It confounds things like the stock of a wealth 
versus a flow of income. Um, the panel did not feel as though there's uh, sufficient evidence or data available to adequately incorporate uh, the uh, assets and debts into a PPM. There's also some potential uh, structural issues on why you may not want to do so. And so we, we uh, are, again, encourage future research on that topic. Now, without further ado, uh, again, thank you all for joining us. I now want to turn it back to Indy uh, and invite the panelists to join me uh, with the cameras on to uh, begin the question and answer part. Indy? Great, Jim, thanks uh, for that. And uh, we still have a good bit of time to do some Q&A. Um, I'm gonna let the panelists also jump in uh, after I ask a specific question and uh, feel free to answer another question that we've seen pop up, especially in the Q&A box. But I'm gonna start off with uh, Bobby, um, Barbara Wolf. And uh, the first question, which we received uh, a version of beforehand is about recommendation 3.4, which requires information on health benefits that vary among states and even within many states, as well as by family size and across employers. Um, Bobby, could you talk about uh, your and the study panel's belief on how practicable this recommendation is? Okay, let me start by saying uh, that I appreciate the clarifying question. Um, the way that we envision this working is that the emphasis really is on the uh, ACA benchmark plan. And what we understand from the health insurance market is that most plans are actually, most employer-based plans are actually more generous than the benchmark plan. So we're assuming uh, that if you have an employer based plan, that it does meet that need. So what we do then in terms of the employer is we add for the individuals covered under that, we have the same need as if you were covered by um, the ACA instead. And then on the uh, resources side, we add the full value. Then we subtract uh, any premiums that the individual pays toward that plan. Uh, and that gives us the value. Now, what that means is that incorporating differences geographically is we are really looking at healthcare markets. And so those rates do differ by the markets, but that, that information is information that is tracked and is readily available. So another component of the question suggests, is it practical? And we believe that it is. Uh, the Census Bureau already has some working papers using it, and they believe it's feasible as well. So I think that answers or replies to the question. I think so as well, Bobby. Thank you for that. And just uh, a follow-up to stay with you. Uh, there's obviously uh, going to be some break in the data here. We're using something that came out of the Affordable Care Act to some extent that helps us uh, measure the need for health coverage and uh, also the value of the resource of health plans. So if someone wants to develop a historical series, is there some way to still do uh, meaningful comparisons over time? Or uh, is that just ill-advised? Well, we recognize that there is this trade-off and that by going and making the recommendation on this way to incorporate medical care, that there is no way to accurately have uh, a series that goes back before 2014 when the ACA was first implemented. Uh, I believe that people are clever and they might come up with ways uh, to uh, create in putting aside the uh, medical care or uh, tying it to the percent of uh, GDP spent on medical care and do some um, imputations that will allow them to go back. But I think in terms of accuracy and seeing exactly how this would work, you could start in 2014, but not go back earlier. But again, people are creative. I believe that uh, if you have a question you wanna ask to see and uh, the focus is not medical care, that you could certainly easily do that. Thank you. 
Bobby, I'm going to shift to Jane um, for a question around uh, child care. And um, we have a recommendation, of course, uh, that if a person from a household with a child uh, present who is initially not working or enrolled in an education or training program that enrolls in such a program and pays for child care makes them more likely to be classified as poor, putting aside for the moment, uh, the possibility of receiving assistance. Um, does that seem reasonable? Um, and of course, some families may be required to make such switches as a condition of receive, receiving some public assistance. Um, does that strike you, Jane, as reasonable? Um, it actually does strike me as reasonable because um, if someone does uh, is in education or training, they may be deriving long-term benefits from that. You know, that's why people, you know, hopefully would invest in education or training. And so in the long run, we hope that that's going to yield returns in terms of their income and their family resources. But in the short run, if someone moves into education or training and has to pay for child care, they, they do have less income available to buy food and pay for internet and phone and housing and transportation and all their other expenses. So I think it is accurate to subtract out the cost of that child care, as we do if somebody's working. And then if they're fortunate enough to get some child care assistance and get through the voucher system and get a child care subsidy or a child care tax credit or some assistance, then that would make them less likely to be poor. And we could calculate the impact of that policy on reducing their poverty. So those all seem like desirable things to me in terms of having an accurate understanding of who's poor and the role of government programs in reducing poverty. Hey, Jane, uh, let me just follow up with another question for you around uh, the research, including as uh, looks like uh, Hillary Shager has posted around quality, which you've obviously done a lot of thinking around. Um, what more do we need to happen to sort of catch up in some ways to where we are with health coverage and medical care, the way you described it in your presentation, um, in the realm of childcare? What, what research needs to happen? Where What is the sort of status of uh, moving forward with our recommendation on treating childcare as a need? Um, I wish I could say that, you know, um, I'm really optimistic about how quickly this is going to move forward, but I think it's really challenging because I think our data about child care costs are not as good as our data about health care costs. And children of a given age use many different types of child care and different packages of child care, and those come with different prices and different qualities, different prices within type and then different prices across type. So even if you wanted to establish what's the cost of, say, infant care in Boston, so an expensive child care market that I know people were referring to in the chat, well, is that the cost of a babysitter for an infant? Is it the cost of group daycare for an infant? Is it the cost of a family daycare? Is it the cost of a nanny? Is it the cost? You know, there's many different types of care, and they all come with different prices and different quality. Uh, so... I think we have to think about, do you pick the dominant type of care and then establish what a reasonable price is for minimally adequate care for a child of that age? Or do you somehow have like a weighted average of the different types of care that one might use? Um, it's really tricky and we're sort of just at the beginning of thinking about it. Uh, so I certainly invite people to chime in because this is an area that's pretty wide open and where we need lots of data and lots of good thinking. Um, I guess I should also say, I know there were some questions in the, the chat about what about what about children or adults who have disabilities. And as we thought about childcare, we just started also thinking about issues related to disability. And that, I, as I recall, that was another area that we flagged for future research. We did. Um, so thanks for reminding folks about that live, Jane. Um, I'm going to shift to housing and to Ingrid uh, for a bit. Uh, Ingrid, you talked a bit about this, but uh, could you say a bit more about how housing costs and FM, FMR are measured at a level uh, more specific than regionally? Uh, so we know that some counties are much more expensive than nearby counties and 
um, you know, maybe some of this is rough justice, but could you give a sense of the level of geographic detail we can uh, get to with our housing recommendations? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, we're recommending relying on the HUD's um, fair market rent, right, annually collect fair market rents, which are adjusted geographically. And specifically, they are calculated every year for every HUD metropolitan area in the country, plus basically every rural county in a state. So one of the, let me just say on the rural side first, that um, one of the real advantages we see right now, the way that the um, the supplemental poverty measure considers the, the um, shelter costs basically the same in every rural county in a state. But but as we all know, there can be a lot of variation in across rural counties within a state. And so this would, using the fair market rent would allow the census to, to and this measure the PPM to, to account for those cost differentials across rural counties within the state. And then, and then you know, generally um, we think about, um, you know, the fair market rent is aimed to capture the costs of rent in the local market, right? And so that's often what we think of the housing market is a metropolitan area, sort of it's a city plus its surrounding suburbs. Um, for those of you that are sort of familiar with census project products, you know, that the most typical measure of a metropolitan area is the core based statistical area, the CBSA. That is um, mostly what HUD uses, but in some cases in large um, in large metropolitan areas where there's a lot of variation and costs within an area, they actually split those, um, those uh, CBSAs into sort of component parts. So in New York City, for example, it's just, I think I'm gonna get this right, I think it's New York City and Rockland um, and Putnam counties, I think. Um, so Nassau and Suffolk are separate, Westchester is separate, sort of the New Jersey portion of the New York metropolitan area is separate. And actually in, um, in Madison, um, Dane, for those of you that are local, right, to, to IRP, Dane County is actually considered a separate a separate HUD FMR area to, to account for the fact that the housing costs are, are higher there than they are um, within surrounding counties. So um, that's basically the geographic level. That's great. Very helpful, Ingrid. And another big decision uh, that we made was including um, uh, mortgage principal payments, um, not including mortgage principal payments as homeowner user costs. Mm -hmm. um, could you talk a little about what our collective thinking was there and sort of how feasible the recommendation yeah. is? Yeah, so let me say up front that that was not a recommendation around there was that there was full consensus around the recommendation. Um, so most of us felt that um, that interest payments should be surely be included as a user cost um, interest payments for households with with mortgages mortgage interest payments. But the principal payments really are very different right because essentially what what principal does is you're kind of just. You can think of it as sort of transferring funds from one savings vehicle to another, right? You're taking cash and you're putting it into equity in your home. And so um, and so that really, so you're not losing that money, right? And so um, you still technically can access that money, right? You could draw down that equity. You could get a um, another mortgage. Um, you could get an interest only, you know, an interest only mortgage, um, you know, so most of us felt that that um, mortgage principal payments should not be included as a as a um, user cost, which is also consistent with sort of a, a, a previous um, interagency um, council um, uh, recommendation. But I think that for um, you know for the folks on the on the committee that felt the principal payment should be included they just they felt like those are required those are mandatory payments right that households have to make at the same time they make mortgage interest payments and um and that that money is then at least not accessible over the short and medium term right arguably medium term also for consumption so so i will be honest that there isn't there there was not complete consensus um and i believe what we sort of recommend that only interest payment that principal Payment, mortgage principal payments be excluded from user costs, we do also recommend that the census do further study on this question. 
and how and how uh, yeah. would really impact both poverty levels, but also the distribution of poverty, spatial distribution. And uh, th thank you, Ingrid. And yes, I I uh, remember the disagreement, which I, I certainly contributed to. Um, I'll just flag that the Sagarner at um, BLS just pointed out in the Q and A that. Uh, she, with a colleague, will be pre presenting research using net implicit rental income and resources at a conference soon. And while I have you, Ingrid, for a second, I don't know if you can see Laura Wheaton's uh, question. Um, hi, to Laura. Um, but how do we handle the rural counties that don't have a lot of population? So uh, pres presumably there's challenges with maybe suppressed data and using FMR for some of those counties. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, I think there's a there's a difference in question, and maybe maybe Jim wants to talk about this sort of the sort of the disclosure issues. I mean, I think that in general, I mean, there's a difference between what you know what census can use kind of behind its walls to calculate poverty rates, and what actually would be disclosed to the public. And so I think that that you we census can use this the the measures that um, that HUD uses. There there are some adjustments for very small rural counties with with few renters that um that HUD uses. So I, I don't want to exaggerate that um but they can get um they do get you know pretty good estimates for for rural individual rural counties and those census would have access to in calculating SPM. Thank you, Ingrid. Um, and we still have about 10 more minutes for questions. I'm going to maybe come back to some folks, but let me get to Jim for a couple of questions. Um, Jim, in particular, can you uh, remind us the geographic levels that, uh, that the data used in the proposed measure overall are going to be readily available for local estimates? Um, and uh, in particular, uh, county, city, zip code, census tract. So probably depends on some of our recommendation around the ACS uh, being used, the American Community Survey versus the CPS, the current population survey. Uh, but if you could discuss some of that, I think that would help folks actually um, think about how to use a potential PPM. Sure, sure. Great. Thank you. And and hopefully I'll answer uh, Laura's question and, and, and her follow up as well through, through the process of this. So currently the the uh, supplemental poverty measure, right, has geographic adjustment uh, through a few ways, uh, but but primarily in the in the housing uh, cost adjustment where it's adjusted for um, a little over 300 metro and non-metro areas uh, around the country. That's the primary mechanism through, the, through which uh, there's geographic adjustment. In the proposed PPM, you're gonna get geographic, you're gonna get more geographic adjustment. You'll get geographic adjustment in the ACA plan. You'll get geographic uh, that's used in, uh, on the threshold and constructing the basic need. Uh, you'll get geographic variation in the use of the FMR. Uh, you'll get geographic variation in the child care uh, need in the threshold as well. So you really are getting geographic variation from, from uh, all three sources. So there will be uh, uh, a greater dispersion, as it were, of uh, basic need across the country under the PPM, which I think many people who are on this webinar and around the country involved in uh, research, policy making, and advocacy are oftentimes, you know, concerned about our current measures of whether or not it's capturing the the well-being of individuals in their in their wider community. And we think that the proposed PPM is going to be a step forward in that regard. Um, now, in terms of constructing the the PPM, one thing that's it's important for people to to understand that. Um, the current current population survey, in fact, every survey, you know, primarily that released, there is a public version and then there's an internal version. And the public version does a number of things to the data before it goes out to the public. Uh, sometimes, well, income is oftentimes top coded, right? So individuals paid above the top code, top code are, are assigned the top code value. Um, uh, the Census Bureau actively engages in imputation, and so if somebody refuses to answer what their earnings are, 
they will use a procedure to impute a value of earnings to that individual. Um, the Census Bureau does release in the CPS the state that the individual lives in, and for a subset of individuals, the county or residents, but not all counties are identified in the, in the CPS. In the American Community Survey, the lowest level of geography you get in the public version is what's called the PUMA, the Public Use uh, Micro Data Area, which is a population of 100,000 individuals. So the city of Lexington, Kentucky, my home base, has roughly 300,000 people. And so there'd be roughly three Pumas in the city of Lexington. Okay, so that's the finest level of geography you get in the public release version of the, of the ACS. Um, and so the, the Census Bureau does this to protect respondent confidentiality, right? So as a mechanism to try to improve response rates and conditional on responding the quality of data, they want to ensure respondents on these surveys that uh, their data is held in extreme confidence. And uh, there are concerns about that, that uh, 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 privacy when you move to smaller and smaller geographic areas, it might be easier to de-identify or re-identify somebody. And so, uh, so that's why there's a difference between kind of internal data and public data. And so right now there is a mechanism called the uh, Census Research Data Centers, a federal statistical research data system that can get qualified researchers access to more uh, granular data for these surveys. Now, Laura highlighted that uh, in past practice, the SPM, all the components of the SPM were publicly available in the uh, uh, CPS ASEC to kind of reconstruct the, the, the poverty measure. Our panel is not recommending that the Census Bureau not make the, the, that possible. What we're recognizing is that the Census Bureau has a fiduciary duty to maintain uh, uh, respondent uh, confidentiality. And in the process of constructing the PPM, there might be some components that they do not want to wish to make uh, public, okay? Because it's too too narrow of geographic uh, detail. This is not a decision for the panel to make. This is a decision that the Census Bureau uh, uh, and other members of federal agencies need to make about what's the appropriate level of geography to to be made available in the public data set. It doesn't mean that you won't be able to identify who's poor and not poor but whether or not you can fully reconstruct all the individual items in the proposed PPM and public data is yet to be determined, okay? And uh, it may require in some situations going into the restricted environments to do a, a full reconstruction. Great, uh, thanks Jim. Um, I think that's quite helpful to clarify. Um, and thinking about one, use we've seen already with the SPM at the state level. Uh, some folks, I think IRP has even been helpful in the state of Wisconsin have used these measures to analyze the effects of public policy at the state level. Based on what you've just shared, um, do you feel confident that um, a PPM if adopted would uh, similarly be uh, useful, usable um, to evaluate the impacts of public policies? Yeah, I think so, especially, you know, at the at the AC, you know, with the fully developed PPM uh, in the American Community Survey. So currently, the Census Bureau releases, you know, poverty rates at the county level uh, in the ACS using the official poverty measure. Uh, in theory, you should be able to get those estimates as well uh, with the PPM, right? So, so that's, you know, a step below so that to help you understand you know, the poverty status uh, at the local level. Um, and so I do think there's the potential with the ACS development for using lower level of geography below the, uh, the state level to better understand and track the well being of families. So also, and therefore, get a better understanding of what's happening uh, in your more localized communities. Um, you know, in the public sphere, there's always going to be limitations on what's made available, again, for this issue of respondent uh, confidentiality. But I do think that there's the potential for uh, 
for a more granular understanding of the impact of the tremendous resources that the federal and state governments uh, spend on households and understanding their impacts on well-being. Thank you, Jim. And we're almost at time. So I'm going to give uh, each panelist maybe 30 seconds to say anything they want to say that they haven't, especially in light of the questions in the chat in the Q&A box. And I'll just uh, uh, run through an order. And then, Jim, if you want to say something about sort of what's next very briefly at the end for your 30 seconds, that'd be great. Or else I'll try to sneak in just a couple sentences on, on what's next. So uh, first, let's go with uh, Bobby. I just want to pick up on some questions related to the population with uh, disabilities. It is true that we do not fully deal with that population, their extra expenditures. By incorporating medical care and including, although capped, the non-premium uh, medical out-of-pocket payments, we go to some extent to try to capture health care differences. But this is an this is a question that we recommend that there be far more study. It is an important question, um, and we only have a partial answer to it in this proposal. Thank you, Bobby. Um, and let's jump to Jane. Yes, yeah, sort of building off of Bobby's comments. I mean, this is a work in progress. Uh, the SPM was such a huge improvement over the OPM, and this is the PPM will be yet another improvement over the SPM. And I'm sure five or 10 years from now, we'll be revisiting this and working on the next improvements. Uh, but I really want to applaud Jim and the panel for their diligent efforts um, at really moving the SPM forward. Uh, you can think of it as being SPM Mach 2 or Mach 3, whatever it is. Um, I think we've really moved, moved the ball forward, uh, but there'll be lots more to do uh, in the next round. Well said, Jane. Um, let's jump to Ingrid. Yeah, I'm just going to say the same thing, really just sort of echoing um, thanks to, to Jim and my fellow panel members and just say sort of what a, what a privilege it was to get to, to work on this report and to learn so much from all of you. So thank you. And thanks to the audience for all your great questions. Thank you, Ingrid. Uh, Jim, do you want to uh, yeah. almost close us out before we turn yeah, back yeah. to Judith? Yeah, I, I, won't, I won't fully close out. I think Judith might do that. Uh, and so, uh, again, thank you, uh, Indy, Jane, Bobby, and Ingrid for joining me today. Again, for the other panelists on who, who's worked so hard over the last uh, two years in putting this uh, report together. Briefly on kind of next steps, um, you know, the report is, is out. It's in the public domain. Judith sent it out to the chat. Uh, paper versions will be available soon. Uh, print versions, I should say, as well. Um, it's now uh, up to the Census Bureau, right, for next steps about what aspects of our recommendations they want to move forward with uh, and how. Um, we have proposed, I think, in a very ambitious agenda for research as well. So I do expect the Census Bureau will be re reaching out to the research community writ large for advice and input and support and trying to uh, implement and move forward some of these recommendations. And so it is a collaborative effort uh, and, and moving uh, the needle on these measures. And I think we want to, uh, again, thank the Census Bureau and Bureau of Labor Statistics for the tremendous work that they've done on behalf of our nation to, to help us understand this uh, important problem. Judith? Or Indy, well, did you want a, a final word or? Sorry, okay, Judy. Well, I, I want to thank all of our panelists, um, Indy Dadagupta, Jim Ziliak, who Jim has, has put up with us asking every few months when the report might be ready and we can do this webinar. <laughs> so I'm glad we finally got to do it. Also, Bobby Wolf, Jane Wald Fogel, and Ingrid Gould Ellen. What a great discussion, you know, filled an hour and a half and could probably fill another uh, few hours, but such great information and we'll look forward to following the progress of this proposed new measure. I also want to thank Dawn Duran and Natea Taylor from IRP for the tech support. Everything ran very smoothly, thanks to those two. As we mentioned before, we'll be posting the slides and the recording of the webinar within a day or so, and you'll receive a link to those by email if you registered for the webinar. So thank you all for joining us today, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.